All right, everybody, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we have two first-time speakers. They've got 12 years in the OPSEC territory. Uh, and they're super excited to be out here. Uh, one's from Arizona, one's from Minnesota, so obviously it's ice and fire. Um, so we've got Jonathan Fisher from Minnesota and we've got Jeremy Miller from Arizona. He's the local boy over here. Um, and they're excited to talk to you about Injectile and Hyde, which is very heavy metal, so I kind of love it. Uh, but without any further ado, these are your speakers. Thank you for coming. All right, before we begin, can I get a show of hands of how many people actively use hardware implants today in their engagements or their testing? We got one. Do we have two? No, just one, all right. Well, hopefully by the end, there'll be more than just one. So with that, I'd like to introduce our talk, Inject on the Hide, pushing the future of hardware implants to the next level. Who are we? My name is Jonathan Fisher. I have over six years in the InfoSec community all of that's been on the offensive side of things. Prior to that, I had over a decade of experience designing, implementing, and programming industrial control systems and off-highway uh, control systems for uh, machines such as bulldozers, cranes, things of that nature. And in my spare time, I like researching hardware, RF, and IoT security. And hello, my name is Jeremy Miller. Um, I have over 12 years of information security experience. I've worked on red and blue teams, done a bit of security research and engineering, and worked in different industries such as retail, finance, hosting, and life sciences. So a bit of a work disclaimer, this security project is based on our own research and not on behalf of our employers. Okay, so what is this talk about? We're going to go over why we decided to build our own USB implants when there's already great commercial and open source tools out there. The journey of building the implant. So we're going to go from the C2 that we built to the hardware we designed and the software itself. And the biggest one, we're going to go over what does the implant do? What makes it so unique compared to everything else out there? Start off, we'll begin why are hardware attacks still prevalent today when there's plenty of other attack vectors? So the biggest one is they're great for man the middling a device. So if you need to get in the middle of like a keyboard or a mouse or a monitor, um, it's still a pretty great covert way to do that. Also, it's amazing to gain access to infrastructure or even just data. So you could have a hardware, hardware implant that actually allows you to pivot around the network um, secretly or maybe you just want to interface with like a storage device and exfiltrate data through there. Lastly, um, hardware attacks are amazing for bypassing security controls. So if you're trying to download a payload and it's getting caught by like a firewall or a WAF or something, you know, if you're pulling it locally through like a serial line or something, a lot of EDR tools and network tools are not going to catch that. So it's a great way to do this. There are plenty of implants out there now, both commercial and open source. We'll kind of run through some of them. So looking at this image, a lot of these should be pretty familiar, especially like the Keycroc Mac 5, the OMG cable by MG, and even the USB Ninja. These are great for um, just like education and security or maybe using on an engagement. There are other implants like the Keylog those are usually used for a little more nefarious reasons. Maybe a tech, non-technical person wants to actually like spy on someone. So a lot of good commercial ones. A couple points about these. So because they're commercial, they're gonna be pretty unique or innovative in features. You know, they're, they're selling a product so they need something kind of special about them to grab you. Also, as long as people are buying these devices, um, they're gonna continue to support them. And usually the hardware and the software is be pretty stable. A downside of the commercial device though is they are closed source. So if you're using these on like a critical infrastructure, some kind of engagement where you have sensitive data, you may not want to because you're not able to fully audit um, the software or even the C2 if it's not something that you're running yourself. The other aspect of these is the open source implants. So some of these are they're definitely not new to the security industry. I'd say last like 20 years. Um, these are pretty familiar. They've been released at DEF CON or maybe a certain 
government leak has like involved the uh, creation of them, but these are some of them for sure. Open source ones are amazing because they allow us to audit and learn from them. So we feel comfortable and we're confident in using them in engagements. Secondly, uh, such as our project, um, they pivot with innovation. So there's been things like a lot of the bad USB or the NSA playset were actually inspiration to us to make this implant. And kind of a downside, um, if people are not actively using these tools in engagements, support kind of fizzles out. So um, kind of one of the minor downsides, I would say. So with these commercial and open source ones, why would we still want to create our own? A big one is we actually want to learn how to create the hardware itself, the PCB, because we had special devices we wanted to implant. So we had these keyboards and we want to have a custom PCB that would fit in the encasing. Also, we did not want to rely on the victim's infrastructure. So some of these implants um, or man in the middle devices rely on the victim's 802.11 network or maybe they actually use another protocol that's commonly sniffed for. And that brings us to a next point. We wanted to use an entirely different OSI physical layer that was not common to this. Another big one is if we did create something like this, we wanted to make it open source. So as we felt comfortable using it, maybe other people would as well. So when they improve upon it and they can audit it, you know, it's kind of like a back and forth security check in that sense. And lastly, we didn't just want to implant or compromise a few devices. You know, we wanted to implant 10, 20, 50 devices, and we wanted a C2 that would support all of that. All right, so now that we know why we built it, let's talk about the one we actually built. We affectionately dubbed this Injectal and Hide. At the core of our implant is the SAMD21 chip. Uh, in fact, we use two of these chips. One reads in the head packets from the head device and the other one relays them back out to the uh, target. And the nice thing about these chips are we can flash them with the Arduino bootloader which allows us to then progr uh, program them with the Arduino IDE and leverage the standard libraries in Arduino and use the uh, forums too if we need any help. And these chips are unique in that they have extra serial communication lines that are software enabled. They refer to them as CIRCOM in the uh, documentation. But this allows us to add extra features as we need like uh, audio visual sensors and extra radios, memory, things of that nature. So the next most important part on this device is the XB3 radio. Now, this is made by Digi International, and the reason we chose to go with this radio is because it allows us to do mesh networking over RF. So this is how we really achieve that scalability through the, um, through the mesh network. And with the mesh network, the more devices we add, the larger our attack network gets, and we can even shape it to go around obstacles as needed, something you can't do with uh, 802.11 AP. And the mesh networking allows us to send broadcast messages to all the, uh, all, excuse me, all the implants at once, or even just one at a time if we want. And Digi incorporates the authentication and encryption in their setup software for the radio, so we don't have to worry about adding that on our own. All right, besides the radio, we also implemented some storage features. For our first run of implants, we decided to go with the micro SD card. The reason we did this was it's cheap, it's easy to replace if we fry it, and um, readily available. But we know in the future it's got limited write cycles, we want to expand on that, and we want to shrink our footprint, so we're looking at NAND flash memory for uh, future development. All right, so now that we know what's on the board, let's talk about how it's evolved over time. We started with the uh, proof of concept. We knew we wanted to build an implant. We knew we wanted to use off-the-shelf components to uh, try it out ourselves. So what you see here on the bottom are two boards, both running the SAMD21 chips. The uh, first board is on the left is the Trinket M0. Now at the time, this was the smallest um, off-the-shelf commercial board that we could get for a footprint. And on the right is the Arduino Nano 33 IoT board. And this was a brand new release when we started this. And the nice thing about this is it came wired with extra serial ports on it. 
and it also had built-in BLE functionality. So those two components were what we would implant in the keyboard, keeping our device small and allowing us a wireless exfil path out of the keyboard. But this still didn't achieve our desired goal in doing the um, expandable or scalable networking. So we had to find something to bridge that gap. And that board was the SparkFawn XB3 Thing Plus board. And this board allowed us to bridge the BLE to the Digi Mesh network. And we could program this with MicroPython, and so it's fairly simple to operate. And then we just doubled up for the C2 board. And that worked. Uh, we got a working prototype out of it. It was great, except that there was a noticeable lag in the uh, time the victim would press on the key to when they would see the keystroke. We're talking half a second, three quarter second. We figured that was enough for us to start looking at our keyboard and figuring out what was going on, so we figured the victim would too. So after some troubleshooting, we figured out that the problem lied in what we call the extender, the thing that bridged between the two uh, wireless communication protocols. So to solve that, we added a second board. We added a second nano board and did all the uh, translation of the BLE on that, and then just communicated over UART to the uh, SparkFun Things board. And that worked, we got rid of the delay by doing that. And here you can see, this is what the extender would look like on a breadboard. It's got the Arduino Nano 33 board on the left, and it's got the SparkFun Thing board on the right. And it's kind of hard to see in the wires, but on the top there, there is a blue and a white wire. Now those are the UART lines. And the reason that's significant is because this did not work right out of the box. Uh, the documentation from SparkFun says that the UART should work, but it doesn't. If you go into the Arduino forms, they refer you to a special library for the Arduino chip to interface with it, but it's gotta be over SPI. Now we figured it out, and I'd love to say we did it on purpose. In fact, we even claim we did. But the solution to this problem was to short out the I2C bus to allow the UART bus to take over. We reached out to Digi and they told us it shouldn't work. But it does. We just uh, felt like it wasn't the proper solution for a long-term uh, prototype. So we decided to strip the board down to what we really needed, and that was the Digi radio. And so that brought us to the next prototype. We just used a Digi radio straight to the C2, and we already had the processing and the logic in the nano board, so we could just stick with the Arduino and the extender. And that worked. Um, it worked just fine. It did everything we wanted, but there's a few things we didn't like about it, and I'll get to those in a second. Here you can see what it would look like uh, with the extender and the radio. And the thought process here is that it wouldn't be so bad if you stuck it behind like a monitor and you had the implant in the keyboard, but it's still extra devices you have to implant and it still increases your chance of getting caught, especially with the BLE, because the BLE is noticeable with anybody with a smartphone and a free app. So we opted to drop that all together and just go straight XB from the implant itself. Now this increases the size of the footprint, but we felt that uh, it created less complexity in the overall design and allowed for a much stealthier implant itself. So now what you see here is the Trinket M0, the Arduino Nano 33, the uh, XB radio, and then another XB radio for the C2. And this is also the phase at which we dropped in the micro SD card for our storage. And this is what you'll see today on the PCB itself, um, only with commercial products. But obviously this is a lot to cram into a keyboard. Most people notice a bulge at the keyboard at this point, so we decided to keep going with it. And uh, show you a little bit about what it does look like with the commercial products. Here, it might be a little hard to see, but down here is the XB radio. This is the uh, keyboard controller to an Arduino, or sorry, a uh, Trinket M0, and then it's a little harder to see, but there's another Trinket M0 up here somewhere. And uh, that was before we had the micro SD card and didn't need the extra lines, but this was a proof of concept for getting it inside as an implant into a keyboard. And here with this beautiful wiring job that I'll take credit for is the breadboard with the actual components on. So you can see it's a little bit of a mess to try and cram in, but Again, we have the Arduino board, we have the SD card, we have the trinket, and then we have the radio down there. 
So the next logical phase for us was to do what we did with the SparkFun board and strip it down to just the components we needed, which were just the SAMD21 chips. And we did that, it worked well. Uh, the only thing we had to do different at this point was we had to flash the dev boards with the uh, uh, Arduino bootloader itself. So we could then just program the chips just like any other board. And that worked. Uh, we had no issues, but again, we're not gonna fit that into a keyboard. You uh, would definitely notice that and we're going the wrong direction. If you didn't notice it, we'd just shoulder surf and take your password that way if we wanted it. So again, this works, we got stripped down. There's extra components on these boards to allow for um, noise reduction, voltage regulation, and things of that nature. So the next step for us was to break this down to just the chip level. And so we brought this down to a prototyping board where we hardwired everything. So on the left is the SD card breakout. We have the two USB in and out. We have test sockets here for the two SAMD21 chips so we could just drop raw chips in and wire straight to the pins. Here we have serial wire debugging ports so we could flash the chips on the fly and debug them. And then we got the radio right there. And that's the top of the board. We had all the extra stuff on the bottom. So this is where the capacitors, the uh, crystals, the resistors and stuff lie. It's all underneath. And this gave us enough confidence that we could then proceed with our PCB design since we got it ironed out which components we needed to uh, give us a stable connection. And that gives you the layout that you have today on the PCB. This is the production model of the inject on the high board. So all you have to do is add the radio, the SD card, and you can drop that into a keyboard or any hidden device and relay out to the C2 running just the XB radio. Now that you know what we put on the board, let's talk about what the board does. We've covered a little bit about the mesh networking, but this board can also do keystroke injection through standard Arduino libraries. And because we're handling the keystrokes as they come in, we can also sniff them as well. But with the SD card, we can also add the ability to record the keystrokes as they come through. And we offer the uh, reverse shell over the mesh network, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's a unique concept, and we exfil data over the mesh network the same way. We also offer a key press timer. This gives you an idea of when we last detected a key press uh, to better let you know how live this implant might be if a keyboard is actually connected to it. And we implemented some other features as well that we thought were useful from other implants. Now you're asking yourself, how do we interface with this? Well, it's pretty simple. We wrote a custom C2 with uh, Python and all you need to do is import the Digi library, the Bless library, and then connect a uh, XP radio over USB to it and you're off and running. All right, I've got a demo to show you. Okay, so I'm gonna pause a few times during the demo. Or does it not show it up? No. Nope. All right, technical difficulties. There we go, okay. So in this demo, we're gonna go over actually starting the C2, the Python script, and connecting to the C2 radio. Um, in this one, we're actually going to pick the COM port and then the baud rate of the radio itself. Kinda hard to see, but it's a terminal. Starting a Python script, it's gonna ask what the COM port is for the radio, and then we pick the baud rate. So this is, you can see it, the menu for the C2 itself and all the functions we have. So the next thing we're gonna do is the important part. And that's having the C2 actually look for all the implants in the network. This is done through the DigiRF mesh network. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna select the option for scanning for implants. So it's a 10 second timer. 
And then if you can kind of see right here, that's the MAC address or the address of the implant itself. So if it was able to find more, it would show up on this list. And then we have a different way of formatting that as well. So you can actually name it like HR keyboard or finance keyboard, something like that. So once we identified what implants are in our vicinity, we can activate it. So that's option four, I believe. So I'm gonna pick the implant that I found, activate it, and then to actually see if it's a running implant, I'm gonna get the status of it, which we'll talk about later, but it'll return the status of the implant itself. And then a pretty common feature of these type of devices is the actual keystroke recording. So on the left side, it's gonna be the victim. The bottom right is the victim typing. And you'll see in the top right, as they're typing, they can, in real time, they'll see the uh, keystrokes. And then with the live recording, we'll also do recording to the actual SD card itself. So in this case, you can tell the implant to continuously record the keystrokes and write it to the SD card. So again, the left side is going to be the victim and the right is the C2 itself. Okay, so the C2 is going to list the files on the SD card remotely. We'll see it in a second. Hard to see, but you can see there's two files on there. So I'll grab the actual keystroke file, number one. And it's downloading over the mesh network now. And then locally on the right side is gonna be the uh, C2, the attacker, and you can see the keystrokes. The formatting's spaced out. You can see there's return lines for all that. So we are working on that. Um, we also save the head scan codes. So if you, you know, weren't translating them correctly, if it was a different language, you would have the raw codes to decipher from there. And yeah, that's the uh, keystroke recording live and setting up the implants. All right, I gotta find the X, help me. There, okay, yeah, cool. All right, so now that we know a little bit about what it does, let's get into some more depth here. So our design goal was covert and scalable in network. And by doing this, um, we have some authentication encryption. Now this is done by Digi. Uh, the authentication is like Zigbee, you have to have a network ID, you have to have a uh, sleep mode timeout and, or a setting, and then you also have to have the channel right. Uh, unlike Zigbee, there's no PAN ID, you can set to zero uh, with this one. But they also offer encryption. Now, depending on the radio model you have, you can do AES-128 or AES-256 encryption. You just enter the key. And so that's one way we were able to scale or uh, secure our network. Um, then we have the mesh networking part, which lets us scale it up to an enterprise level compromise instead of just uh, one-offs. And then the other benefit to the mesh networking is that we are able to extend the range like we talked about. But this radio actually doesn't use Zigbee, it uses DigiMesh. This is a pre uh, proprietary protocol with Digi. And it's a little different than Zigbee in the fact that you don't have a controller. Every device that gets put down with DigiMesh is its own router. So it makes provisioning really easy. Every device can be identical when you drop it in, just with a different name. And then um, DigiMesh allows you to get up to a thousand nodes at one time without any uh, alteration to the network itself. And like we mentioned before, we can control them all from one C2 with the global broadcast if we want, or we can just do individual commands. And these radios, so the XB3 Pro that we're using right here can get up to two miles line of sight uh, indoors. It can get up to 300 feet with obstructions. And if you go sub gigahertz with another model line from them, with the right power and the right antennas, these radios are designed for things like oil rigs and they can actually reach out to 65 miles. So for those that don't know what a mesh network is, this kind of gives you an idea. 
the C2 is in the middle and every node is a router. So if we want to send a message all the way to the farthest endpoint, it will go through the other nodes. And this allows us to self-heal. If a device goes down, they'll find another path. And this is how we can also shape it around obstructions like concrete barriers or walls. So we talked about joining the network, we've talked about encrypting it, but we also implemented an enable feature. So let's say somebody discovers that we're there and they want to interact with us by replaying a message. Our device needs to have an enable message first before it will respond to anything. Without that, it'll just be passive and send keystrokes through. And once it's enabled, then it looks for very specific commands, uh, user definable, and that will trigger the modes that uh, you want it to go through. So the, with any kind of manimal device, um, this is how we achieve the keystroke injection, sniffing and recording. So right now, um, John mentioned we have the two CMD21 chips. So how it works is one acts as the USB host, and this is what the actual head device itself interfaces with first. And we use a project called USB Metamorph, and this project was actually made for people that want to develop like joysticks or really cool keyboards with you know special buttons. Um, it's a great project. It is able to take hit codes very fast and translate them to um, an actual character that we're looking for. So what happens is that first SAMD chip will send over that char code to the USB client chip. That's kind of the brains of the implant. So not only will it just pass over the um, actual hit code to the victim's computer, you know, so it's, it achieves pass through in that sense. It sniffs it, so this interfaces with the SD card as well. So it's saving data. Um, it also interfaces with the radio itself. So that's where it's getting its commands and sending everything back to the C2. Okay. So we talked about some of the modes this can be in. I don't know if you saw in the demo, we actually got the status of an implant and returned three different things. This is one of the modes it returns. So insomnia mode at a high level is a mouse jiggler. So what happens is it moves back and forth. This one's pretty cool, the way we developed it, because if you're staring at the screen, you're not gonna recognize that it's doing this. It also doesn't give you that drunken mouse feeling of, you know, if you move to the right and it slides over there, that does not exist. So it's pretty cool. And the purpose of this is to keep the computer from going to sleep. And by default, this mode is turned off by default. So you can do a mass turn on insomnia mode. You can sp uh, pick specific implants. It just depends. As mentioned, we have a status update. So this is kind of how we see if the implant is working, if it responds back with these statuses. So the important ones are, hey, are you currently recording keystrokes? And do you have insomnia mode turned on? The other important feature, and we use this for injection um, to give us confidence in when to throw a PowerShell script in, is we can see when the last time they pressed a key on the keyboard, which is pretty useful. And since we have an SD card, we do story and memory management. So from the C2 over the mesh network, we can actually push new injection scripts. So we don't need access to the SD card to load things locally. We can do that remotely. We can also enumerate the SD card. Um, this is important because we like to know if we're recording keystrokes, what kind of artifacts are on there. And we want to see what kind of injection scripts we already have on there as well. And like a typical memory management, we can erase data if needed, and that's important for the next feature. So if we feel that the device has been compromised in any way, we can send a command to go into the go dark mode. So what that does is it actually disables all functionality on the implant itself. So it'll turn off the keystroke recording, insomnia mode, and it'll wipe whatever storage is on there. So in this case, it wipes the SD card itself and it goes into like a sleep mode. So it'll wait for us to re-enable it with a specific command. One of the features that um, we mentioned before is we actually do our reverse shell through the Digi RF network itself. So we don't rely on the victim, we don't rely on um, any other network infrastructure at all. So what happens when you plug in the implant itself, not only does it create the HID device, it will open up a general COM port as well. And you can actually name, you know, let alone the HID and the COM port, you can change the VIP HID for this. 
So if you have a specific one you want to mask yourself as you can. What happens is, and this is where the other functions like the last key press and Somnia mode help, we, like a rubber ducky style, we push the PowerShell payload to the victim, so it emulates the keystrokes. And what the PowerShell script does is it attaches itself to that con port, opens it up, and it kind of listens. So from the C2, you can attach yourself to that COM port over the DigiResh uh, mesh network and do like a who am I or something that relays it to the PowerShell process that's hiding in the background. And when it executes, it'll send it back through the mesh network to your C2. So it doesn't rely on the victim's infrastructure at all. Using that same idea is we, we actually steal data um, through that COM port as well. We have a data exfil script. So it utilizes the exact same COM port that we open along with the de uh, hit device. It will run a PowerShell script. So from the C2, kind of like how you would SCP or FCP a file, you give it the full remote path on the victim's machine that you want to steal a file with. This is done like through your reconnaissance you did through the reverse shell. It will grab the contents of the file, base 64 gzip it, and then it'll pass in chunks the um, limitation of the actual packet size of the, the radio itself, which is 256 bytes. And you can set this within the script, and it'll pass it over the back to the uh, DigiMesh network to the C2 itself. And because it's base 64 and gzipped, the integrity of the, you know, those characters is very important. If you're missing a character, your file is destroyed. So error handling is done not only on the radio side, where if it's missing a packet or it's out of order, it'll ask to resend it, but PowerShell kind of has like a SYNAC method that we use to verify that we sent the correct amount of bytes. And you don't necessarily have to run this as a brand new script. You can utilize the reverse shell that you, you previously opened. All right. All right. All right, so here's the C2 video. With the, uh, we're gonna start with the reverse shell. It's kind of hard to see, but here we're selecting to launch a script and we're gonna push the uh, reverse shell script. And as we do that, uh, we go in, we select our target, we select our script. And then here you're gonna see the keystroke injection pop up. And then hide it in the background as a process. Now that it's created the uh, reverse shell over the COM port, we're gonna go back and connect to the COM port through a different option. And then we're going to, uh, once connected, we're going to enumerate the file system and look for a target file that we wanna exfil. And there we can see we're listing the file system. We find a file called loot.txt. And so now we're gonna go and uh, attempt to data exfil that file. So here we're gonna launch our data exfil script. Again, we're gonna choose our target. And then we're gonna give it the file path to the file that we want exfil. And then we're gonna name it what we want it to be saved as locally. And it's gonna launch the script here. And then you're gonna see some uh, messages as the data comes back, verifying the uh, base64 encoding of the file that we received. And now we're gonna open it up and look for the file ourselves and check the text. And that proves out our uh, successful data exfil path over the mesh C2. Okay, so now you've seen the high functionality of the implant itself. How does it meet our needs? 
So like most implants and types of these types of devices, um, this is a great way to have persistence to a victim. So hopefully if the, they restart their computer or the PowerShell process dies, we can just redeploy it through that implanted keyboard. The C2 activity itself is not using their network or the victim's infrastructure at all. We're using our own. For injecting PowerShell scripts, it's kind of the worst thing is you're trying to push a PowerShell script while they're looking at their computer. It's gonna freak out most people here. So with the two different functions of insomnia mode, which helps prevent their computer from going to sleep, and the last key press, we have pretty high confidence that we can time a, a good attack. And with this type of implant, if we need to extend the range, then we just throw in more implants. And they don't necessar necessarily need to be implanted devices. Um, the radio itself can interface with like a USB charger or something. It only needs 3.3 3 .3 volts. So we could plant repeaters around if we needed to. All right, does anyone here I don't know if we asked this in the beginning, actually do any war walking or look for rogue networks in their organization? No? Oh, one person? I'm curious, do you look for like rogue IoT networks or just like 802.11? Rather not say. Okay. I was, we're curious. It's, we hope, you know, this, this kind of brings discussion that it should be beyond looking at, you know, SSIDs and hidden SSID networks. We should be looking at all rogue networks and especially IoT type networks like this. So one of the biggest defenses, obviously, is war walking, looking around your network um, for stuff like that, or your location. If you're in a really isolated area, that's pretty easy to do, like a distribution center or maybe a data center. But if you work like in a retail store, that's gonna be pretty difficult to do. Um, obviously, the next one is you could tamper tape your devices. That's, it may be a little extreme depending on your location, but if you work in a pretty critical infrastructure, that's definitely a good idea. And the biggest one, that we believe is you should buy your devices from trusted vendors. So there's actually been stuff in the news the last few years where people are buying stuff from like third party bidding websites or marketplaces. And they're noticing that like maybe this keyboard seems built a little differently than ones they bought originally. So if you're able to buy, you know, especially like your peripherals, maybe cameras, monitors, mouses, keyboards, uh, buy them from the source that you trust. So we've shown you at a high level the version one that we have. Um, this is already spinning up ideas of how we can do things differently uh, soon. So we wanna add another device to the implant, kind of like a microphone, mostly an audio sensor. We think this will be like the trifecta of timing a good time for throwing in a uh, PowerShell script. So the idea is if you know that you're keeping the computer from going to sleep, if you know the last time you hit their keyboard, if you're able to monitor sound and find like a static level, a baseline, you know, you might know if someone's talking near them or, you know, you want to make sure no one's looking at the computer screen pretty much. Solar monitors instead. Solar monitors, okay. Yes. Solar monitors will detect sound, low vibrations, and other ambient uh, vibrations. Oh, okay. That's a good point because we thought about if they're at their desk, just texting on their phone, you're moving around. We want to, de we want to detect that as well. So, okay, good to know. We also need a smaller footprint. So this works with the key keyboards we want to implant right now, but we have plenty of ways we can reduce the footprint. So the first one is the radio itself. Um, due to availability, we're using one of the pretty big antenna, as you saw in one of the screenshots. And we could actually move to a micro, which is about 60% smaller in size. Storage, we're using SD card uh, breakout, which is pretty big. We can move to NAND flash, which would reduce that by like 80%. And the next spot is um, the debug pins are nice, like the JTAG pins and our um, SWD for reflashing it. But if we remove those, that's gonna reduce the footprint as well. Also, as you saw the Windows XFIL script and the uh, data XFIL, uh, right now we're working on porting those to Linux and uh, Mac as well. And you know we're not totally tied down to the, the, the Digi Mesh RF um, radios are amazing but they're very expensive. When we started doing this two years ago, I, th I think they've doubled in price since then, and you can't even really get them anymore, unfortunately. Um, so we're looking at using other radios, such as like LoRa or something. And that's not the only hardware we're looking at replacing. We also have the uh, RPi 2040. So right now we're using two SAMD 21 chips as the host and the client uh, chipset. 
we can actually use the RPI 2040 and that'll take care of, that can actually act as host and client at the same time. It contains 48 pins, so we'll have enough space to talk to our other peripherals too. So looking at doing that. And yeah, so I wanna give a special thank you to the EFF that kind of helped us um, give guidance on how to release this safely without getting in trouble. Also wanna uh, thank Soldier of Fortran and Redfish for mentoring us on this. This is our first talk. So we didn't really know a good way to organize this and present it, so they helped a ton. Thank you. Uh, we also have our contact information up here. So th this presentation we're gonna release, um, I'm sure it'll be on the B-Sides media server, hopefully. So on the left side is our personal information, on the right is the actual injectable and hide um, account as well. We set up a Discord, so we're hoping people wanna use this, um, and yeah. We set up a Discord and chat live. And the most important source, I would say, is our GitHub. So this contains everything from the C2 source to the schematics for the PCB. Um, we have schematics for enclosures now, if you don't want to put it inside a keyboard, and the actual Arduino code as well. So it contains everything. So this isn't our last talk. We're actually going to be in Hardware Hacking Village on Friday at three o'clock. This is gonna be a deeper technical. It's gonna go into more of the prototypes that we built and uh, issues that we had. We're also gonna be at DEF CON Demo Labs where you can actually play around with this. So we'll have a C2 set up and a couple implants and we're hoping we can kind of mess with the range and show people what it can do. And yeah. And we do actually have, you wanna talk about the Twitter and releasing the PCBs? Yeah, sure. So we do have uh, a few PCBs that have everything but the radio on them right now. So they got the SAMD21 chips, everything's like the capacitors and everything's on the board themselves. And we will give away a few of them if uh, you guys want to interact with us on Twitter, ask questions or retweet, whatever. We'll uh, come find us at Hardware Hacking Village and we'll hand them out to you guys. All right. Is there any questions, concerns? <laughs> so I guess it's 2.4 gigahertz, but also can do sub gigahertz as well. So she asked what um, frequency this was on for the radio. So 2.4, but as Jonathan mentioned, it can go to sub gigahertz as well. Presumably the right now we're using the USB 2.0 line so you're looking at 500 milliamps which is enough to get it out um, of the keyboard and I have actually went half a block with mine through a basement and been able to relay out and then your real limitation is your initial exit vector out of your keyboard or your implant. After that, you can drop a repeater in and give it extra power, give it a better antenna if you can hide it well, and then you can really start covering some range that way. Yes? Yeah, I, I've had very good luck with more of 900 megahertz using the SX1276 uh, chips. Yep. So I've actually gotten two miles out of it. Okay. As far as, I was doing it across the hood screw from one side to the other, you have to crank up the power and you can actually get two pieces of wood. So, and sure. the one I was using was, I was actually using on the health side ESP32s. Yep. It's got ESP32 and Aurora and everything, and a little LED thing on it. It's pretty cool to work with. So, sure. I don't know if we can do anything else with it, but wherever it's worth, I think we can do Okay, yeah, and that's the nice part about this design is that we just use the uh, serial connection so we can pivot through radios as we see fit or as we want to adapt to whatever environment we want to be in. Yes? How long? It's pretty, it's pretty quick. Um, so how easy and how fast can you actually implant a device? So if you have good soldering skills, it's not very difficult. Um, on the, what you need is access to the actual keyboard um, controller. So it's just USB pretty much, ground power and D plus, D minus. So when we showed you some of those pictures, we actually had USB headers on there. But when we implant it, those headers don't exist. So we just kind of route them through the board itself. 
So it depends. If you've never soldered before, you're probably going to break a few keyboards with controllers, but um, it's not too difficult. And then, and then to add on that too, uh, we're working on a design where some keyboards have the header pins already on. So the nice thing about releasing the full PCB design through like Easy EDA or things of that nature is that you can go in and design your own. So you can actually drop header pins on where you can just disconnect the controller. You know, put your own header pins on so then it's just plug and play at that point. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you demoed uh, live keystroke playback and logging. Can you do both simultaneously? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, the question was, can you do live keystroke recording and uh, sniffing and recording at the same time? You can. And in fact, when we do the live sniffing, it records it on the C2 for us. So you don't have to enable that individually. And then w when you go look at your loot files or whatever, it will tell you live keystroke and it will label it with the Mac or the um, appropriate name that was assigned to the implant at that time. What's the cost? The cost? <laughs> what are your connections? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the chips themselves run about four bucks, so you're looking at two chips. The PCBs, if you get them made, what are they, like two, three bucks? Four, ten? It was, uh, for a hundred PCBs, it was like thirty bucks, so it's not horrible. The, the most expensive part is the radio itself, so that's why we're exploring other options. The radio used to be twenty yeah. bucks, twenty-five bucks, now yeah. it's like sixty, so. It's just, that's just the chip shortage though, so we're just trying to migrate around it and find alternatives at this point. Yes? Do you have any of the boards here? We do, yes. We can hand them out if you guys would like to take a look at them or uh, come find us after. We can pass them out quickly. I think we've got enough time, right? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Oh yeah, so it's it's the controller we're worried about the most. And the ones that we're implanting, there's actually a few models that we implanted. Um, where the mic where the the keyboard controller sits is pretty big in most keyboards. So it sits flush with that and that's all we really care about. Cool. Yeah, we hope to see you guys this week at Hardware Hacking Village and DEF CON Labs. And like I said, we have PCBs to hand out if you're interested. And if you really think you'll actually use, use these on engagement, um, you know, we'll talk to you. We have some that are pre-built. So love to talk to you guys. All right. Thank you.